an amazing lead. And once again, I find myself standing here, I have a, a message on my heart, and yet it's already been preached, <laughs> which is amazing. And it's times like this that I always think, um, how wonderful when God's in charge. It's weeks ago that the Lord laid this on my heart. Uh, Pastor Mark asked me to fill in a spot. And I just went to the Lord and I said, well, what do I talk about? And it just came in one word, love. Which was a bit of a bolt out of the blue, because it's probably not the, the thing that was in, in my daily thoughts at the time. But I thought, okay, what can I do with this? Well, it's fairly easy, actually, because if you go to 1 Corinthians 13, there's, there's a list of bullet points, aren't there? Love is patient, love is in Christ. And I started off like that. Bullet points. We'll just go through this, you know. Almost like a business meeting. But as time went on, the Lord just took me in a slightly different direction. And just laid different things on my heart. Opened my eyes to new things as well. Um, so there's no bullet point list today. But however, there is a lot of scriptures. Um, and I don't make any apologies for that, um, because to be honest, when I'm listening to a sermon, I'd rather see and hear what God says directly than just to hear somebody that's just expounding, and expounding, and expounding all the time. You know, that's good. But I just want to know what the Lord says, what his word says. And this, this is where I'm coming from this morning. But, but love, I mean, it's such a big subject. Um, that, might, that word love might look black, but I did actually do it in blue just to soften it a little bit. Yeah. I, I did think about doing it in pink, but I thought no, no. Because actually that's what I want to get away from this morning, is the preconception of love, especially the worldly conception of love. You know, we, we think of love as being all chocolates and flowers and Romeo and Juliet, when actually real love out in the world is looking after the sick, feeding the hungry. It's soldiers standing on, on the line to defend. I saw something recently on, I think it was an American YouTube channel, and it was saying, when you sit down for your dinner, thank God for the farmers who grew it. Thank God for the distributors who brought it to you. Thank God for the soldiers who let you eat in peace. You know, and, and this is love. It's it's very practical, you know. But um, I'm going to come at it from a slightly odd direction because what I'm going to actually do is follow our brother Paul's lead in, in his letter to the Corinthians and actually, first of all, talk about the gifts of the Spirit. <clears throat> it's um, a slightly different subject altogether, and I won't go in, into the details of that. But I just feel that, um, well, it just came to me, really, that if this is how Paul leads into his great chapter on love, there must be something in it. So if that's where he started, let's, let's do the same. In Pentecostal circles of the church, we, we, we do love and appreciate God's gifts. Um, gifts of his Holy Spirit, gifts given to us according to his mercy to equip us and empower us to govern and build the church, to minister outside, to do the good works that he's given to us. And the Lord knows that if we try and do those things on our own, well, we do fall short. You know, our strength fails us, and, and even the love in our hearts can sometimes fail us as well. Our wisdom certainly fails us. But actually, when we walk in the Holy Spirit, when we use the gifts that God gives us, we see amazing things happen, which, which is outside of us. We often feel like we're in the back seat and God is driving things. That's how wonderful it is. And the Apostle commends us, doesn't he, in that same letter, um, at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He tells us, earnestly desire the best gifts. He's encouraging us. He say, tells us that he doesn't want us to be ignorant about spiritual gifts to be unaware or uninformed, which, which sadly, over my years, I've, I've seen many areas of the, of the church, the church with the big C, um, 
they are ignorant and, and they have put them aside to the point that many have denied the gifts that God has provided. But instead Paul says to us, he wants us to desire greater spiritual gifting. Earnestly is the word he uses. That is sincere, deeply, seriously, intensely. Desire the best gifts. And the Lord knows that we need them. Later on in chapter 14, Paul says that he wishes that we at least all spoke with tongues, but were also gifted with prophecy. Wow, he's really wanting us to have these gifts. And he's speaking by the Holy Spirit. We, we know that the words that Paul wrote down are now counted as scripture. They are, as, as it says elsewhere, God breathed and they're written for us. So let's begin on that basis, an, an earnest, earnest desire to, to clothe and equip ourselves with every provision made by the Holy Spirit for this new spiritual life that we've been given. To love and serve our Lord Jesus with all our heart, our soul, our mind and our strength. At great cost we've been given the opportunity to be born again and are made beneficiaries inheritors of every good gift and every spiritual blessing through Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know about you, but I, I just found, going through this again, I, I found myself really excited. Not only are these gifts available, but God through his word, through, through his servant Paul, is in earnestly desire, reach out for these things. And that's really exciting. It should shake the complacency out of us. And yet beside all this gifting that God generously and eagerly desires to bestow upon us, our brother Paul says something far more excellent is available to us. So what could be more excellent than possessing God-given gifts of prophecy, wisdom, discernment, knowledge, healing, miracles, knowing the languages of men and angels? What could be more excellent? Paul ends his earnest encouragement to desire the best spiritual gifts by leading us further to a greater level of life and service with this amazing statement. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. And yet, beside all this, I show you a more excellent way. This is the lead into that famous chapter 1 Corinthians 13. So it needs to be taken notice of. There, there are some Bibles where you get a heading on different passages, don't you? I, personally, I don't find those particularly helpful. I find those distracting and irritating, to be honest. But there was one Bible that I came across recently, and, and the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13 had a heading, and it said, The Greatest Gift. Now we just came from 1 Corinthians 12, which is talking about all the gifts of God, the spiritual gifts. And this was headed, the greatest gift. Now there's a question for us to think on. Love, godly love, is it a gift? Is it a fruit? Certainly in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, it reads, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So the fruit of the Spirit is love. But also in John's Gospel, we read this in John chapter 1, beginning of verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, some versions say he gave the power, to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, born of God. Does that not tell us that the power to love, to love in a godly way, is from God? We are changed, transformed. We are become like our Father, to love as he loves. But certainly that is a gift. And so I quite agree with whoever put that, that chapter title on, The Greatest Gift. 
The greatest gift that we have in our lives is love, and that is godly love. We're not talking about the, the love that we have once known in this world, uh, you know, which has all its limitations, and we'll go into that later on. But also the very fact that God gives us his love by his own will, by his grace, by his benevolence alone, not because we earn or deserve it, that in itself is the beginning of our understanding of what love, real love, really is. It's equally true from what the Apostle writes in Galatians, that God wants us to grow in that love, in that spiritual gift in that spiritual quality. Even spiritual fruit needs to grow and mature. Imagine that somebody gives you a potted plant and you're delighted to see it, to look at it, look splendid, it maybe even smells wonderful. You've received a beautiful gift, but then what? What do you do with that gift? Most of us are probably stick it on a window ledge and then watch it wither and die. So I suppose, how many people here are of, of that ilk that cannot, for the, for the best will in the world, keep a plant going, that always just watch it die and somebody else has to buy another one? I, I always used to be like that. Could not for the life of me keep a plant going, whatever I tried. Um, but I found out something a few years ago. Uh, my daughter had an orchid given to her as a leaving gift from one of the hospitals she was in. And she left home um, a year or so afterwards. And I saw that plant there, she left it behind, she didn't want to take it. And I thought, I want to keep that going because it has a, a memory. So what did I do? I didn't just do my usual, just throw buckets of water on and you know, all that kind of stuff. No, I actually looked up how to look after it. And I found out it wasn't half as difficult as I thought. Because this particular orchid, I found out where most people go wrong is they keep watering it. What you should do is not water it. And a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. And you know, that, that plant has flowered twice since. Sadly, I've neglected it a little bit lately and it's looking a bit limp and floppy. But I'm starting to take care again to revive it. So this wonderful gift that God gives us, this love, we should learn from God's word. We should learn from the maker's instructions how to grow it, how to make it thrive and bear fruit. We need to nurture it. But there's also a wonderful reality to the love that God gives to us. And that is his love as an endless stream that supplies us. Whenever we feel that we're, we're withering, we can seek his presence. We can drink afresh of his living waters. We simply return to our first love, Jesus, and just know again that we are loved and know that we are held precious in his eyes. We need to feed it. Let's read what Paul says in that famous chapter. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and I will give my body to be burned, but have not love. It profits me nothing. I just want us to think about that for a moment as a Pentecostal church. It doesn't matter how gifted we become. If we don't learn to motivate and exercise ourselves with love, with godly love, we gain nothing. We profit nothing. In the colloquial, we're a waste of space. And I would suggest that this is what the Holy Spirit says to the church, capital C. 
it could easily take the wind out of chapter 12 for us that what is the point of all these gifts? And it could e just easily make us think that all we need to do is just concentrate on love and we can forget the rest. But no, no, these things go together. The apostles already told us that these gifts are important and greatly desirable. Uh, greatly desirable. Um, unless he changed his mind. But no. Here, he, here he's telling us that the gifts of God must all be underpinned and founded upon godly love. They're not for self-gratification or reward, like, like Barak, who was hired to use his prophetic gift to curse Israel. He made money out of it. Or for attention-seeking, display or vain glory, like Simon, a man in Acts, a man of great reputation, from bewitching people with his former sorceries. And when he saw the apostles, the gifts and the powers that they had, he offered them money to buy it. Nor are they for personal ascendancy, or even for the subjugation of God's people, like the priests and the Pharisees of old, who rose through the ranks to sit at the best seats and in the best houses and amongst the most important people, while they neglected to feed God's sheep but robbed them in exchange for lengthy prayers and took the finest choice of their sacrifices and offerings in the temple. Amazingly, this letter to the Corinthians is written to a church where members of the congregation were actually suing one another at the courts where they scoffed down their bread and wine of communion without thought for anyone else around them. Where there was much disorder and injustice among them. Where they treated one another differently according to their wealth or their status. There's no doubting that the apostle had lots of work to do to sort out their many errors. Yet this is the church to whom Paul wrote to educate and encourage them in spiritual gifting but not without giving them to understand that these must all be underpinned with the greatest gift. If we, this morning, thirst for the gifts of God, then we seriously need to ask ourselves why. Is it from a desire to serve God and his people, to serve those outside the church, or are we thinking about ourselves? The Apostle says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And again in James chapter 4, You ask and you do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. And this is why godly love must be the more excellent way to follow. Let's carry on from 1 Corinthians 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But then, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And we can see from this how that the gifts 
are given to us for a time while we're still children. We can only see in part as in a mirror. We can only see dimly, not clearly. But when we're made perfect, in the coming time, in, in the time of Christ's eternal kingdom, we will be made mature, perfect, adults if you like, knowing all things. We have no need for those gifts. We'll have grown out of them. But now abides faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And what do we think love is? As I said before, we can easily mistake love as being well, an emotion. And it can be, but primarily love is an attitude. We see that throughout the, the scripture. Love is an attitude, a state of mind. See, I cannot feel goodness towards everybody. My emotions can often be offended and hurt, and they might even be damaged. And I'm going to shock you now, but sometimes I'm in a bad mood. Sometimes I'm very grumpy. Don't know, don't know all the tests to that. <laughs> it's impossible for me to love anybody like that. My emotions are negative. But even in that state of mind, I can still choose to exercise love. I can still choose to keep patience in, into, into play. <coughs> When God says in Matthew uh, chapter 5, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. How easy is it to love those who despite, despitefully use you and hate you? But the last part of the scripture there contains a clue to be as children of our Father in heaven. We now know the love of God, not because he happened upon us on one of his better days, when he was feeling particularly good about things and he was full of benevolence and bubbling over with compassion, rather because he chose to form a plan before we were ever born to seek after us to, to win our hearts with words of forgiveness and reconciliation when we were still his enemies. And to provide for us the substitute of his only begotten son to take upon himself the full punishment rightly due for our sin. This was not an emotional impulse. There was emotion was there. And if anybody is in any doubt, yes, God has emotions and displays them often. God's own love was thought out and deliberate, born of his nature and character. What of our own nature? Are we as children of our Father in heaven? The Bible tells us that we need new hearts and minds like our fathers. In Matthew chapter 12, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. We cannot love without first knowing the purest love that comes from God. Once we taste from that fountain, all other forms of what we consider to, to be love become impotent and, and the shallowness is evident. Again in uh, 1 John chapter 4, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And John the Gospel in chapter 3 and verse 16, which I'm sure you know of heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Have you ever considered how easily that Gospel text could simply read, God loved the world and sent his son. What a different reading that would be. And it would be sufficient. All except that God wants us to really know how 
heartfelt and passionate he is in his love for us and how assuredly that love is given to us. These are the words that the Lord Jesus himself chose to speak when telling us the message. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. How much has God loved the world? That he sent his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish. That is how God so loved the world. He sent his Son, his only Son, that if we would believe in him, Jesus Christ, he would pardon our sin, reconcile us to himself, and give us eternal life. When Jesus went to the cross, I see the outpouring of the heart of our Father in heaven. And this is echoed in a passage from David when his wayward son Absalom was killed in 2 Samuel chapter 18. And David cries out, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Though his son Absalom was rebellious, murderous, ungrateful, treacherous, adulterous, and greedy to rule over the kingdom without God's calling and anointing, greedy enough to kill any of his own family that got in his way, still David says, if only I had died in your place. Have any of us yet come anywhere close to having the heart of our Father in heaven? <coughs> I see also the, the father of the profligate, the prodigal, each day checking, looking out to see if there's any sign of his wicked, reckless and shameful son returning to him. And on the day that he did return, his father was over the moon. In Luke chapter 15, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It takes on to Luke chapter 15. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Have any of us yet come anywhere near to having the heart of our Father in heaven? And it's worth repeating that, that, um, that famous gospel verse, John 3 and 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. If you're here this morning and you have any doubts about the love of God to you, then look at the cross. Look to the cross. See Jesus hanging there with his life drained away, poor and pitiful, naked and beaten, humbled for all the world to see and scoff at. And now ask yourself this, did he have any doubts whatsoever about how much he loves you? Psalm 103. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And this morning, I just want to invite every one of us just to draw near to Jesus with a full assurance of faith, nothing doubted. Let's discover afresh our first love. When the depth of the love of Christ is known to us personally and intimately, it produces a profound effect in our very hearts and nature. Even the most hardest and the most pained of hearts is transformed. We are filled with his love for us. And we are transformed into the children of our Father in heaven. Because the same love overflows, it cannot be contained, it overflows from within, directly from his own heart. 
We go to Luke chapter 7. This is the example. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him more? And he said to him, Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those that sat at the table began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I fall straight on with another scripture because, again, we just want to hear what the Lord says on these things. From Matthew chapter 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. How often we feel like that when we're just in the presence of God, when we're just in that place where we're receiving from Him, nothing else matters. Bernard of Clairvaux, an abbot from the Middle Ages, or just after the Middle Ages, penned a beautiful hymn called Jesus, the very thought of thee. And this is what he said. But what to those who find are this, nor pen nor, nor tongue can show the love of Jesus, what it is. None but his loved ones know. We love because he first loved us. Now I take a little diversion here, talking about love, because a lot of our understanding of love is based upon the writings of the ancient Greeks, and they were very clever fellows. And they came up with the idea that there were seven, or some scholars say nine even, types of love. And you may recognize some of these. So the first one that we're familiar with, Eros. Some places it's called romantic love. Some places it's described as an intense sexual desire. Now, to my thinking, I kind of find it hard to pair those two together um, because they're not quite the same. But anyway, we, we're talking about Greeks and philosophers here. Then there's philia, affectionate love. Storgi, familiar love. Uh, pragma, enduring love. Um, and I've no idea how to pronounce this, philautia. Self-love, self-compassion. 
lewdness, playful love, flirting, and the one that we're very familiar with, agape, unconditional love, selfless. Well, like I said, the, these Greeks were very clever fellows, but I disagree with them. I think that love can be better classified in just three simple kinds, emotional or passionate love, intelligent or mindful love, but also physical love as well. Let's look at the, the three anyway. Emotional love, uh, this is more recognisable as the instant feelings that drive us. Passion, compassion, pity, empathy, self-sacrifice, etc. We hardly need to think about these, these things. They drive us. Then there's intelligent love. This is where we need to think it through where we may need to make considered decisions, whether or not and how best to act upon emotional responses. But then there's also physical love. I think this is the, the one that manifests the other two. As far as I can see, the, the Greek classifications constantly fluctuate between these three. And for this reason, I think these three simpler identities are more helpful for us when recognising the virtue and the effectiveness of love in all its forms. From this basis it's also easier to see that love has to be in balance. Either one of these without the other has its pitfalls. We are well understanding that emotional love, if exercised solely by itself, can be the more vulnerable and prone to impulsive and ill-conceived behaviour, to manipulation, to deception and, and false impressions. And so uh, Paul writes to um, Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, For of this sort are those who creep into household and make captive of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. We see so many times, sadly, um, even on Christian TV channels, people take advantage of people's goodwill um, to get money out of them. You know, we can, we can be very drawn into those impulsive reactions through our emotions. But at the same time, we shouldn't be afraid of our emotions or of expressing them. I have been to churches in the past where the hymn, hymns are sung as words and any kind of song that would just so-called rouse people up, heighten the blood, whatever, oh no, 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 don't want to show emotion, that you know, will we'll get carried away. But here's the example, John chapter 11, Jesus wept. Is that an emotion? Is that an emotional response? We can clearly find all of these three elements in the gospel message. Firstly, God passionately loves us and he earnestly desires to reconcile us to himself so that he can pour out that great love into our lives, into each of our lives, and that we might give him our love in return. Would anybody doubt that that's emotional love? It's fully emotional love. Secondly, before any of us were born, he formulated a plan of salvation in order to make all this possible. Would anybody doubt that that's intelligent love? And thirdly, at the time of his choosing, he sent Jesus to exercise the rescue and open the way. Would anybody doubt that that's physical love? Matthew chapter 21. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he regretted it and went. They came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? I'd like to suggest here, um, and this may be simplifying, 
But I'd like to suggest here that, that each of them reacted initially from their emotional love, but then they later thought things through using their intelligent love and acting accordingly. And in this way, it's possible to see the true man. Who is truly in their hearts, and what, what is truly in their hearts, and, and even in our hearts as well. The one, though he wanted to be obedient and pleasing to his father, he later chose to do instead according to his own needs and to ignore his father's call to please himself. The other son initially didn't want to go at all and perhaps he had his own plans for the day. Maybe he just didn't like vine dressing or grape picking. Perhaps even he thought himself a bit above standing with the, uh, with the workers, with the labourers. Perhaps he found himself or thought himself more suited to be a wine taster or a salesman. But later he recognised the fact that his father had told him to go and he regretted refusing him. Instead he chose to put himself and his own plans aside in order to answer his father's call. Which of the two did the will of his father? 1 John chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. And we're not talking about Jesus here, we're talking about each one of us. Whoever loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. That's our love for one another. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Why are they? If you love somebody, you will bend over backwards for them. But I'm going to give the last word here to, um, to our brother John. In uh, 1 John and chapter 3, another 3 verse 16, um, famous verse. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we're of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him.